Let's talk about earthquake hazards now and some of the effects of earthquakes that go beyond just the simple act of shaking the ground. So as we saw in that picture, ground shaking can topple structures, just topple them right over, can cause damage to structures by ripping them apart as well. Um, it can also cause landslides. We talked about how earthquakes can trigger mass wasting events. That can happen as a result of shaking the ground and destabilizing some uh, loose sediment or some rocks that are just held in place on the surface very uh, loosely. You can have damaged infrastructure that catches fire because of things like broken gas mains or broken electrical lines. Um, you can also have liquefaction occurs where the ground essentially behaves like a liquid and that causes buildings to tip or to sink and to formerly solid ground. Kind of a crazy thing, but we saw some evidence of that in the last slide too, where it looks like the foundations of some of these buildings like this one over here have actually sunk into the ground as a result of liquefaction. There are also tsunami risks. So tsunami are large waves that occur when um, a whole big volume of water shifts suddenly underwater somewhere offshore. Uh, and an earthquake can be the cause of those as well. We'll walk through some examples and talk about some of these details. So there was a large earthquake in Sichuan, China in 2008. Magnitude eight, not by far not the biggest earthquake we've ever seen. Right? We've seen earthquakes that are 30 or 40 or 50 times stronger than this. But given the location and the type of construction that was there, this resulted in over 60,000 people dying, 18,000 missing, many millions homeless just from the single earthquake and over a hundred billion dollars in total damage that resulted from this. So that gives you a sense of some of the possible magnitudes of damage that can happen as a result of earthquakes. Here's an image of some of the damage that occurred in LA in 1994 um, from a moderate strength earthquake. We can see some structures have shifted and you can see some brittle deformation in the structures themselves from where they have cracked, windows blown out here, um, whole sections of the building have collapsed in some locations. So some people were fortunate enough that their rooms did not collapse, but some were not so fortunate about that. Uh, here's a, a striking image of an entire elevated highway that has had its supports break and that has tipped and fallen over, dumping the trucks and the cars that were on that roadway off of them. So this roadway collapse occurred in 1995 in Japan um, and caused a lot of reevaluation of some of the construction techniques going on in Japan so that you wouldn't have something like this happen to a roadway or to buildings ever again. Here's an example of earthquake damage that occurred in Mexico City where an entire building, this looks like it may have even been a parking garage that totally collapsed as a result of this earthquake in 1985. Um, it is really difficult to do search and rescue operations in conditions like these because it has totally destabilized this building. And so any amount of motion could cause more of this to collapse. So you don't wanna risk your rescue workers as much as that is possible, but you know that there are people trapped in a structure like this. And so as best you can, you try to get them out without shifting the structure. And that is very, very difficult to do. I mentioned that earthquakes can generate landslides. Um, so this land surface used to be continuous here. Like here's a section of the land that used to continue flat across here. Uh, but as a result of that uh, Alaskan earthquake, the magnitude 9.21 in 1964, a whole section of this hillside has slid downhill. Right? That's a mass wasting event. And it's taken the buildings that were here with it. There's really not much that you can do if you're building a building um, in a landslide prone area. There's nothing that you can really do to keep your building in place. So the sorts of mitigation that you can do are to avoid building very large structures on these steep slopes and earthquake prone areas. Or else when an earthquake happens, your building is probably going to shift. Uh, the 1906 San Francisco earthquake is an often cited example um, in U.S. history. It 
caused extensive, extensive damage, destroyed maybe half of the city of San Francisco as it existed in 1906. Um, and most of the damage from that wasn't from the earthquake itself, but was from the ruptured gas lines causing fires. And you can see those fires are billowing and just blotting out the entire sky here. Um, and on this, this street here, folks have actually come out to observe, right? This <laughs> isn't a new phenomenon for people to gawk at disasters. You can see all these uh, fine ladies and gentlemen here actually pulling out stools and setting up chairs and watching their city burn. Um, from a distance up here. Liquefaction um, occurs when waterlogged sediments liquefy when shaken. Um, because the pore spaces in between those sediments can be filled with water, um, when they start to move, that water can actually suspend and hold some of those particles up, which means that they're not supported by other particles anymore. And the soil all together, the sediments all together behave like a liquid. And it doesn't take much shaking to cause that. And then your, your buildings can sink very readily. So here I have a video of what that looks like in just sort of a classroom demo. Here you see this, uh, some water large. Ping pong ball in there. Oh yeah, float if given the chance. Here's a weight that's much denser than the sediment around it. The simulated earthquake. Weight sinks as if in a liquid. The ping pong ball floats to the surface. It floats despite being surrounded mostly by solids because the sediment is just a little bit waterlogged. Earthquakes can also cause tsunamis to happen. So here uh, is an image of the effects of one of those tsunamis. It, does, it surprises folks and hits shore in Thailand um, in 2004. This was caused by an earthquake pretty far offshore, which destabilized a section of sediment and that sediment uh, rapidly fell down slope underwater and pushed a lot of water around. As a result of pushing that water, you have a tsunami being generated. In Sumatra, the same tsunami, we can see just how far up that wave actually reached because it reached tens of feet up of, uh, on this uh, exposed island and just wiped out any vegetation along that um, 15 or 20 feet there. There's a person over here for scale. A tsunami at the Fukushima plant um, was a big source of the damage to that nuclear power plant back in 2011. So first the earthquake caused some damage, but then the tsunami rolling along the shore, uh, which actually flooded much of the infrastructure there, uh, is what caused, caused the majority of that damage. So just to review this, uh, if folks are unfamiliar with the Fukushima disaster, um, the earthquake itself uh, was the Tohoku earthquake, because it happened in the Tohoku region of Japan, a magnitude nine earthquake, so most powerful to ever hit, hit Japan and fifth most powerful known. So its focus was 20 kilometer or 20 miles deeper than its epicenter. Um, not a particularly deep earthquake. Um, the tsunami itself reached heights of 133 feet, just tremendous. You know, this is seven, eight, nine, 10 story buildings um, in height, over 15,000 dead and more injured and missing. Um, three nuclear reactors at that Fukushima plant experienced full meltdown, um, causing a disaster that we were able to mitigate somewhat, but still resulted in a lot of radiation release uh, and a lot of blowback around the entire world against uh, nuclear power. Um, nuclear plants weren't just shut in Japan, but all over the world. Um, it caused 
hundreds of thousands of buildings to collapse. So even in a very developed, very prepared nation like Japan, you will still have a lot of damage from these strong earthquakes. And it's something that Japan will always have to deal with because they are located at a convergent plate boundary. So just to show what um, some of the motion of these earthquakes might look like. When you have an earthquake and it pushes rocks or sediments um, under the surface, you have some pushing or some pulling, either way will generate the same type of tsunami. Um, but this whole volume, right, because these, this rock used to be continuous. So uh, if this is a normal fault that's, that's faulting down this way, which is what it looks like to me, um, then this seafloor used to be up here, right? And that means this whole huge volume of water gets suddenly moved when that earthquake happens. It drops down and results in a change in the water column above it. And that wave is going to move as fast as it can along the surface of the water. When it moves into shallower water, it ends up uh, slowing down. The wave itself slows down, because this wave is moving very fast, slows down. But as a result, it actually sort of piles up on itself, which is why the waves get so much higher near shore. Because everything sort of backs up, sort of like a traffic jam of water. And you end up piling all that water onto shore. And then when it washes there, be tens or like we saw over a hundred feet tall in some cases. So how can we deal with these earthquake risks then? We can't know exactly when an earthquake is going to happen, but we can use planning to mitigate some of those risks. If we plan poorly, it will magnify the risks. But there's never a way to eliminate totally the risk of earthquakes because we can't predict when and where exactly they are going to happen. Uh, example of some poor land use planning, we have an image of the San Andreas Fault, outlined here in white, in San Francisco, and all of the lovely development that has occurred directly on that fault. I'm sure these houses um, still around to today in San Francisco would go for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, but you are risking when you buy one of those houses that you're not going to have the big one occur during your lifetime. Um, and that is a real risk. Any, uh, if an earthquake occurs anywhere along this fault that we can see, a lot of these houses are going to be severely damaged by that earthquake. And if not by the earthquake itself, then a by breaking gas lines and electrical lines um, and all the, the secondary effects of that damage. It's hard to tell from this image, but this looks to me like it's either a, a natural lake or a reservoir like here, right here. Um, what do you suppose will happen to all that water if you get motion along that fault? Talk about some of the, um, the, the effects of shaking and the type of building material that you're located on. So frequency hurts. This is just how fast the, the shaking is happening, right? So uh, another way that we can describe it is the period, how long between shaking. Uh, and so we can have shaking that occurs uh, once every five seconds, so very slow period shaking. We can have shaking from an earthquake that occurs very fast, 10 in every second with a period of 0 0.1 seconds per shake. And for each of these types of material, that a structure is built on, they will experience very different shaking patterns, different amounts of acceleration, different amounts of uh, amplitude of shaking, you know, total amount of displacement as a result of building on different materials. Bedrock is generally the safest material to build on. Bedrock actually experiences the least acceleration for a given type of wave. Firm soil is worse than bedrock, but still much better than building on loose and water-saturated soil, which can shake maybe 10 times more in some cases than bedrock does. So building on loose water-saturated soil is a bad idea. We had seen that picture of the 1906 earthquake that destroyed half the city. When that was done, what do you think they did with the rubble? 
they took that rubble and they dumped it into the bay and made some new land. And now there are buildings built on it. So those are the places that you are really not going to want to be if a big earthquake hits San Francisco. There's an interesting effect of what we call resonant period as well. Objects have a particular frequency that they tend to shake at, a particular period in which they tend to shake uh, that are governed by their size. Large objects like 30-story buildings might shake back and forth once every three seconds. It takes a long time for that whole building to sway back and forth. But short buildings might shake at a much faster resonant frequency, back and forth five times every second if they are able to. If you have particular shaking occurring from um, uh, an earthquake that matches the resonant frequency of your building, then it's going to amplify and amplify, and then you're going to really break those buildings very easily if they match the frequency of shaking that exists in an earthquake. Um, let me show you this video demo of resonance occurring. Okay, it's possible to model buildings of different heights by using spaghetti noodles. You need a little weight on the top. In this case, we're using uh, raisins, but you could use little marshmallows. And one might think that uh, given that they're all located in the same location, they'll all shape the same in an earthquake. And what's interesting is if you shake rapidly, like a, maybe a local earthquake would come in and all the spaghetti noodles would uh, shake the same, or in the case that we were modeling buildings, these would be buildings that are all shaking in a similar way. But if the vibrations are slow or low frequency, the tall building will tend to vibrate the most. And for a little bit higher frequency, the middle building might vibrate more. For high frequencies, the short building might vibrate more. In fact, if they, the reason it's important is if the building vibrates too much, it can actually break. So from that video, you were able to tell that the taller spaghetti noodle, the taller building model, shook when you shook it slower, and it amplified the shaking if you shook it slower, whereas the smaller ones were amplified more if you shook it very fast. In reality, it's sort of the in-between buildings that tend to match the shaking of an earthquake. So those in-between heights tend to be the most dangerous. Here's an example from Mexico City from a large earthquake that happened there. Um, and these 11 story, approximately 10 story buildings uh, experienced extensive damage because they matched the frequency of the earthquake. So those buildings tended to have a, a lot more severe damage to them, entire floors collapsing. Whereas this taller building right next door, presumably built the same sort of way that was 18 stories tall, did not experience that same level of collapse because its resonant frequency didn't match the earthquake. So it didn't keep shaking more and more and more. Um, here I want to talk about uh, an earthquake-prone uh, area involving a pipeline. So this Trans-Alaska Pipeline crosses this Denali Fault, this major fault that's had a lot of medium to large earthquakes in Alaska. I want to show how they decided engineering-wise to deal with that. Instead of building the pipeline so that it was secured to the ground, they actually have a set of, of rollers or they're actually um, like Teflon shoes on the bottom of these. So that it allows the pipeline to slide along these rails. It's not really so much that the pipeline can slide as much as it is that when the ground moves, that the pipeline can stay roughly in the same location. And this allows this pipeline to extend and contract slightly in certain locations or to bend slightly and not rupture. So this is the sort of engineering that goes into protecting infrastructure or should go into protecting infrastructure in earthquake prone regions. Another example is uh, some construction that can be built to protect areas from tsunamis. So if you can figure out a way in which to build a structure that would actually 
uh, bend upward and then slightly back out, this will redirect some of that wave action uh, directly back into the water uh, so that that wave is not going to necessarily wash up on shore and wash everything away. Here's a map of worldwide seismic hazards. So our estimate of how much hazard you experience at a given location. So the likelihood that you'll have a damaging earthquake, plus the effects of the material that you were built on, um, plus the effects of possible landslides if you've got very steep slopes nearby. Where do we see the most hazard? We see it in Turkey, in Iran, in the Himalaya Convergence Zone. We see it in Japan and around the Ring of Fire through the Philippines, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia. See some in New Zealand, also in the Ring of Fire. We see it also in the Ring of Fire along the western coast of South and North America, all the way up into Alaska. So for the most part, a lot of these uh, convergent zones and transform boundaries that are on land are the places where people are at the highest risk. If we zoom in and look at the US, it's not just at plate boundaries that there are high risks. You can also have high risks in say, Western Tennessee. Uh, there's a small amount of risk even in uh, coastal South Carolina. As a result of very old fault lines that either used to be plate boundaries or were sort of failed plate boundary rifts that never completed, which is the case for this new Madrid zone that generates some hazard in Western Tennessee. We see a small amount of risk here, even in Eastern Tennessee, from a set of very old faults in the Great Smokies. To summarize, reliable earthquake prediction is past our current abilities. We can't predict exactly when an earthquake is going to happen, but we have a really good idea of regions that have risk because there have been earthquakes there in the past. We might be able to experience some advance warning, especially in the future as our prediction abilities get better from four shocks, but there's no amount of prediction that we think uh, will totally eliminate risk from earthquakes, at least within our lifetimes. It's an interesting app that they've uh, started in California that can provide those tens of seconds um, because it's linked up to networks of seismometers, uh, it can send out an alert to anybody with this app to prepare yourself. But once again, it only gives you tens of seconds because if you're in California already, you're not going to have that long between when the shaking starts near the epicenter and when shaking starts near you. Uh, an interesting tool that anybody can use to look at earthquakes is to look up the USGS latest earthquakes map. Uh, they have a very good interface for looking at where earthquakes have recently happened, uh, color coded by how long ago they happened and size coded by how big they were. And so you can see those earthquakes that are occurring in Oklahoma as a result of wastewater injection. And you can see a lot of small earthquakes along uh, the San Andreas Fault here. Um, some earthquakes even out in West Texas somewhere. Uh, and you can see these both in the US and around the world. So that can be a cool thing if you wanna play around with that. Okay, folks, thanks for listening to this lecture on earthquakes. I will see you next time.